But if you, and so his, his pec minor is tight. You find, identify that the pec minor is short by an inability to push the scapula down on the table and push the hand down on the uh, belly at the same time. Then we want to look at scapular humeral rhythm. So here's a young lady. She's a water polo player. She's got a slap lesion. That's her only pathology. I know that because I scoped her shoulder. But this is just an abduction. If you looked at her from the front and never looked at her from the back, you would say her range of motion was pretty good. She has to make a little move here to get up into elevation. But watch what she has to do to clear the pathology in order to get her arm to come down. That's significant scapular dyskinesis. And scapular dyskinesis, we know, can be from a posterior inferior capsule contracture, which is uh, GERD, and there's no pure definition in, in the literature, but anywhere from 20 to 25 degrees loss of internal rotation compared to the contralateral side, and that has to be measured with the scapula fix. So you do that in the supine position. If you have somebody who clearly doesn't have a scapular dyskinesis, and on the evaluation of the scapula, they have full internal rotation, you don't have to go through this measurement. And then what are the corrective maneuvers to evaluate the scapula? Because you want to identify the pathology, uh, the uh, abnormal kinematics, and then if you can correct them by doing scapular maneuvers, then you know that that's where the pathology lies. So the scapular assistance test is something that was popularized by Ben Kibler, and what you do is you assist the scapula in upward rotation and posterior tilt. This young man has limitation of elevation in forward flexion on the right side, and he has pain, which is stopping him from going up higher. And look at his scapular wing. This is a type 2 scapular dyskinesis, the entire medial border. If I help him, I eliminate the impingement signs, and he gets improved range of motion. He doesn't have impingement that can't be corrected with a scapular uh, program. And then the other test is a scapular retraction test. When I, after you test rotator cuff function, you see if there's weakness, and I'm going to show only in scaption, but you test them in external rotation and in scaption. And if there's weakness, you ha either have them relocate their uh, scapula, which is an active scapular retraction test, or you passively do it, holding them in position. I like to do it in general actively because I want the patient to identify that he, can, he himself can make a change uh, in his exam. So here's some weakness. Watch him wing as, his, as I bring his scapula down, and then I'm going to have him reposition his scapulae, hold him into position, which I could do for him if I was in, in the back, and now test again, and he's got much better strength. So he doesn't have a rotator cuff problem. He has a scapular problem. Now, you can look at this from the back, and, and the uh, Whipple maneuver, uh, Terry Whipple's test for anterior supraspinatus dysfunction is bring, bring the arm across the body, and then um, it, patient have, patients have pain and weakness on resisted elevation. So here it is from the back on that young thrower. Significant winging, significant weakness of his cuff. But now all you have to do is cue him to fire his lower trap, and he can hold it in position, he's got improved strength. And then finally, stratus anterior testing. Um, I don't test that with a wall push-up because I don't think it's very accurate. So I test it eccentrically by putting the muscle out to length because the stratus anterior, what we were taught in school, is a protractor. That means it brings the shoulder forward and up on the, uh, on the thorax. But if you think about what it does eccentrically in the thrower, it's an external rotator of the scapula. So what I want to do is test it in the way it's going to function. Again, the functional evaluation. So here on the uh, unaffected side at 90 degrees and 120 degrees, he's got very good strength. And on this side, he does, he's not bad at 90, but in some throwers you'll find they just drift down on their own. You can see he's already starting to cheat by bringing his upper trapezius in. This, this young man wound up having long thoracic mononeuropathy. So rehabbing his serratus, serratus anterior was going to be quite a project. So in summary on the exam, um, what you want to do is make your exam functional, look at the entire kinetic chain. Don't forget about looking at alignment. Don't look at the shoulder in isolation. <clears throat> Identify the mechanical flaws that you think may explain the clinical sequelae, and then see what you can do in the office to correct it, and that way you've evaluated the function. Which gets us into the uh, guidelines and protocols. Um, now, for this, um, the protocols that I use in general, they, they've been updated a little bit, but they're in your handout in, in, as part of a chapter that was written, and they're on pages 597 through 600. And my thought about this was to give you a protocol would be like being on the uh, Food Network and giving you a recipe. Um, and you don't always have all the ingredients that you need and things change. So you don't really teach somebody how to cook, 
by just giving them the recipe. So for the analogy, I want to teach you a little bit how to cook and how do you think about putting together a protocol. Our rehab is functional. We're not looking to resolve symptoms. We're looking to reestablish normal function. In order to do that, you identify the mechanical flaws on the exam, and the physical therapist does the same. And then you start figuring out what do you have to do to restore the anatomy, physiology, and kinematics. Well, if you get to the point that you've crossed the red vertical red line in Giovanni's talk, you have to correct the anatomy by doing a surgery. And then you go back into rehab to establish normal physiology and kinematics. You want to restore, ultimately, you want to restore the integrity of the kinetic chain, and that will give you normal function. So the guidelines that I'm using now are basically looking at scapular position, pain, alignment, core strength, and exercise progression. And range of motion sort of goes along with, with the flow in uh, pretty much all of this. So for scapular position, we talked a little bit about uh, that already. Um, you, it facilitates rotator cuff function. It decreases impingement and pain. Scapular positioning can actually improve the uh, function of the supraspinatus by 23% on strength testing. To establish scapular position, what we tend to use closed kinetic chain exercises first because what that does is it compresses the glenohumeral joint, it improves cuff activation and proprioceptive feedback, and it decreases the shear stress on the cuff and capsule. So we, get, we want patients to be doing scapular clocks, and this is open chain scapular clocks, but with the arm at the side, there's not a whole lot of stress. And you want the patient to be able to identify where on the clock they are. You want the patient to be able to, early on, one of the first things we do on day one, and I start this in the office before I kick the patient over to the therapist, is I want the patient to be able to find their scapula. I want them to know where it is in space. And then we can do closed chain uh, scapular work just by compressing, if, you, if the hand is, is um, against anything, a table, a wall, um, it's a closed chain exercise because the end, of the, the end of the limb is not moving. Well, let's go back to this young man. Um, the prescribed exercise, you can't say a scapular stabilization program, you can't say just position the scapula, because most of the programs that I read and most of the lectures that I, I hear about scapular thora thoracic rehabilitation is that you have to teach the patient how to retract and depress the scapula. So what happens if he retracts and depresses his scapula? He further elongates his, his upper trapezius and he winds up with more dysfunction because his problem is that his upper trap is weak as can be, which is one of the reasons his shoulder is drooping. So we give him a program which is almost like a VMO set, and this is that uh, picture that I showed you doing the single leg squat, and his scapula, he, he's controlling it pretty well here, but he's coming down a little bit too far. It's a very, very small movement, and when you have a patient with a drooped shoulder, you've got to get them to, to learn how to use their upper trap. Okay, just a, it's a small exercise, but in general, your throwers with a, a drooping shoulder can't do it. We use quite a bit of feedback. We use double mirrors in, our, in therapy, so you can see there's a mirror in front of them, a mirror behind, and we'll inhibit the muscle that needs to be inhibited. Frequently with a hyperactive upper trapezius, we'll inhibit the upper trap, and then we'll use it to identify a function of the lower trap. But what that does is it helps the patient identify the force couples for scapular stabilization and get the arm overhead with less impingement. A painful joint will not progress. I can't stress that enough. It is not no pain, no gain, because rehabilitation should be relatively pain-free. If, if the patient is, comes back to you and tells you that they are having more pain with physical therapy, it's either that the shoulder is inflamed, they're doing the wrong exercise at the wrong time, or they're not doing the exercise properly, either because they're doing too many and the shoulder is fatiguing, or there are muscle imbalances that are not letting the shoulder function properly. When you look at alignment, it's we like to have our patients do, the, do their exercises standing as much as possible because it's more functional. Um, but if you're going to do that, then you've got to make sure that the alignment is correct. So you want a neutral spine, you want the axial skeleton stabilized, and that way you're getting proper activation of the trunk musculature so your kinetic chain is intact. And that takes us back to what Giovanni was uh, showing us earlier. So here's how you test. There's too much lumbar sway here because her, if you think about it as the, with the spine, the, the blocks aren't stacked properly. So you have the patient do, do a little pelvic tilt, line up properly, and now the force is transmitted properly. So it's an easy way to check, to have your therapist check alignment. 